Welcome to part two of the GarageBand tutorial for my Colorado Mesa University students. If you're not a Colorado Mesa University student, this video will probably still be helpful to you, but some of the details do apply to specific assignments that I use within my classes. If you haven't watched uh, part one, make sure to go back and do that so you can know how we got to the point we're at here. But this is a GarageBand version 10.1. I also failed in uh, episode one or part one to show you how to tell which version of GarageBand you're using. So let's get to that now. If you go up to GarageBand, again GarageBand has to be open for this to work. You click on the word GarageBand up in the upper left corner and click on About GarageBand. That will open up a window that will show you which version of GarageBand you're using. In this version, uh, this uh, instance it's version 10.1. Now GarageBand does drastically change every few years, so if you're using an older version of GarageBand, it may look slightly different and things may be in different places. I have created a series of tutorials for an older version of GarageBand, so make sure to look for that as well. I will try to put a link to that on this YouTube tutorial. Now that we know which version of GarageBand we're using, we'll close out of that little window and we'll talk about the interface that we see here. We'll begin by talking about the top area of GarageBand. The very top bar, as with any other program, contains this menu bar with a lot of different options. We'll talk about that as we go along and have need for these different tools, but make sure that you go through and explore the different options in advance. That way when you need a certain tool, it may be familiar to you and you'll be more likely to be able to find it quickly. The next area is this bar right here. Uh, within this area you're able to control your interface a little bit more and see some more advanced options. This is the library which shows this panel right here or this pane to the windows and the library is not the library of sounds you have recorded it's the library of different uh, instruments, uh, different effects, things like that that are available to you. If you toggle this on and off, you'll see that that pane disappears. Most people leave it open, but uh, it does clean up your interface a little bit better if you turn it off. So just know that that's available to you and it is fairly easy to change. The next option is this little button that toggles on and off your quick help. I find that handy when you're getting to know GarageBand because it will open up a little window and it will tell you about anything that you hover over. So for example, this tells me this is the quick help, but if I hover over the smart controls, it tells me what the name of that button is, which is smart controls. And over in that little window, it will tell me what the smart controls do. So you can see that. Also, you have the editor, and that will also allow you to do some more precise editing with your file. So if I click on each one of these, you can see that my interface changes at the bottom of the screen according to the type of editing that I may want to do or the kind of tools that I may want to use. Typically we keep them off and toggle them. The first time you click it turns it on, the second time you click it will turn it off. And the same goes with quick help. The next set of buttons along the top bar are your rewind, fast forward, stop, and play buttons. These are typical and they do exactly what you'd expect them to do. We'll talk about those as we go along. Another important feature is this bar right here. Now the use of GarageBand or how you use GarageBand may affect the type of interface that you want to use. This is set up by default to go into a mode for writing and playing music. So you can see that it has things like the number of bars, also the beats per minute, the key that the song is in, the key signature, and the time that it's in. We are recording a voice project which won't require any music or at least not it won't require any talent or skill for us to play music. So we'll click on this bar and choose time instead of beats and project. When we select time it now shows a minutes, seconds, hours and uh, whatever that is, hundreds of seconds. Um, now that we've got that we can see as we record that the time will change and it helps us edit because we can keep track of precise moments that we may need to edit out or change. The next button is a loops button and I'll show you how that works as we go along. 
but it basically will repeat the sound that you recorded over and over and over. So if you're adding effects or you're adding any type of filter to your sound, you can hear what happens without having to go back and rewind and press play over and over. It will just continue to loop it. The next button is a tuning fork or a tuner and that allows you to tune your instrument. You can actually click on that and play a note and it will help you tune the instrument by using the microphone that's built into the computer and it will tell you whether or not your instrument is on key or not. These next two are also very important to note even when you're doing a voice project uh, partly because they can be useful but they can also throw you off if you're not expecting them. This is your count in. This button right here will give you four beats or however many beats that it's set to before it begins recording. So if I were to keep that toggled on, if I have that set to enabled, which is that purple color, then if I hit the record button, it will count in four beats before it actually begins recording. This can throw you off if you're expecting to begin your project and begin recording the second you hit the button. So if you keep that enabled, it will count in four beats before it starts. If you disable it, then it will start recording the second you hit the record button. For voice projects, I tend to keep that turned off. If it is enabled, you also have this little metronome button. The metronome will produce an audible click type sound as you record. That can be annoying because it uh, will play if you're not trying to keep time. Uh, but the other problem is, is if you're playing the output through your standard speakers of your computer, the microphone will pick that sound up and it will actually become a part of your recording. If you're using headphones, you'll hear the beat in your headphones, but it won't actually, actually record on the track. So just be sure that you enable that or disable that as needed. For the voice projects we do at our Colorado Mesa University courses, you want to turn both of those off and have them disabled because it will be a lot easier to record. We'll talk about the rest of these as we go along because each one has some other options. Uh, but very quickly, you have a notepad where you can make notes to yourself. You have a loops option which will bring up pre-recorded loops and beats to put as a background to a song. And also you have a media button which will bring in media from uh, the iTunes library. It won't work very well for files outside of the iTunes library, but, uh, but that is available if your music is within iTunes or your videos are within, uh, within iTunes. We will keep this feature toggled off in order to give us more workspace during this project. Now we'll go over to these other buttons here. Each track has a set of buttons, and then there's a little set of buttons up above uh, the track area as well. This plus sign will add a new track to the project. So if you'd like to add a software instrument or a second voice track or just about any other type of item to the uh, GarageBand project, you can click on that plus sign and you'll see that happen later on in this project that we'll be adding more tracks. This button right here allows you to adjust the volume in a custom way so you can turn on your volume adjustments and again we will play with that once we get more tracks added into this project. This last button allows you to catch the playhead and we'll probably see how that works as we go along. Uh, if not then you'll be able to ask me or I'll show you how to fix this in class as it comes but sometimes your playhead will actually move off the screen and uh, into a later part of the sound file. If you click on this button, it will automatically zoom in to wherever the playhead is so that you can make those minute adjustments. With each track are also three little buttons. If you have the volume selected on this button here, then you'll see four buttons. But we're going to keep that toggled off until we need it. This first button right here will mute this track. So if you have multiple tracks, clicking on the mute button on each of those tracks will mute just that track and you can listen to the tracks that are not muted. This button that looks like headphones does just the opposite. It makes it so that you only listen to the tracks that have the headphone option selected or the monitor option selected. And then this track right here allows you to listen in to what you're recording as you, t as you uh, 
narrate or as you sing or as you play your instrument, it turns on the monitoring so that you can hear the sound in your headphone or through your speakers. A word of caution here, if you click on this button as you record, you will probably get feedback and some reverb. Uh, so it's good to keep that turned off if you're not using headphones as you record. This next button is actually a volume slider and it allows you to adjust the input level of that particular recording source. If your recording source is too high, then you'll get some uh, distortion and if it's too low, then it'll be just it'll just be too quiet. So it's a good idea to keep this level set so that everything touches into the yellow but never touches the red. You also have an option to pan to the right or left channel and this is nice for recording in stereo. You can even adjust this one adjust one track so it records in the left channel, another track so it records into the right channel and it will create more of an interesting stereo effect. Sometimes it's nice if you're working with multiple microphones or in another situation where you may have one voice in the right channel and one voice in the left channel uh, using different microphones. That can come in handy when you're editing in case one person coughs or some other noise happens that you need to edit out. At this point we're ready to start recording. So go ahead and go to part three and we'll talk about how to begin the voice track in GarageBand.